last week, the, the focus of my message was on one of the most popular verses in scripture from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Well, today I'm going to zero in on another verse of scripture that's very familiar, um, but it's often, it's often used and misused. And, and it seems very appropriate for us right now in today's world. And it's Romans 8:28, and it reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good, for those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. It's probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It's also probably one of the most misused and abused verses in the Bible. Some people read this verse and they interpret it to mean everything happens for a reason. God has caused all things to happen for a good reason. In fact, just this week, I read the headline in the News Gazette, which quoted the pastor of a church that had just experienced a devastating fire. And the headline read, everything happens for a reason. So many people say those words, and and perhaps they believe them in the moment. I'm sure I probably tossed them around a time or two myself. We think about that in light of some of the major tragedies that we've we've witnessed in our own country over the past years. I mean, 9-11 comes to mind. And then who can make any sense out of the mass slaying of small children at Sandy Hook Elementary School? I mean, just this past week, a gunman entered a bank in Florida and killed a number of people. And we can go on and on listing other terrible acts of terror and violence. And and then, of course, we could share on a personal level those terrible tragedies and losses that have occurred in our own circle of family and friends. So I want to share this verse with you, reading it in its broader context with the verses that precede it. And we're going to Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds and spirits and speak to us this day, Lord, the words we need to hear, the hope we need to have. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, bad theology is often used and applied to situations that are not appropriate. Sometimes it's social media that does it. Sometimes it's even Christians, even pastors. Sometimes, you know, when we don't know what to say, 
we ought to really just keep our mouths shut. Back in 2016, there was a mass shooting at a nightclub in Orlando, Florida. And the nightclub happened to be a gay nightclub. And there was so much bad press issued and associated with bad theology in that situation. You know, surely this must be God's judgment being played out. Now, how anyone could believe that's beyond me. And other times when we get bad news or we find ourselves disappointed and confused, this verse gets pulled out of its holster and applied. Life takes a bad turn, and we have a very well-meaning friend say to us, well, everything happens for a reason. Or sometimes it comes in another form. You know, God must be testing you. Or it must be God's will. Or things don't happen to you, they happen for you. Now, these sentiments, however well-intended as they might be, often come out, out of this misunderstanding of Romans 8.28. All things work together for the good. Many take that verse to mean that all suffering is God's will. Do we really believe that God has orchestrated all the pain and tragedy in our lives? Do we really believe that, that when a baby dies, God needed another angel in heaven? Do we really believe that God plotted 911 for the purpose of testing our country? Do we really believe that the Orlando shooting was the will of God? Does God need all of those little children in his heavenly angel choir? I mean, if, if there's any truth to that, then what does that say about the God that we believe in? the God of love and compassion. I don't know about you, but I don't want to believe in a God like that. There are individuals, even churches, who believe in that kind of God. Churches known for their hate and not their love. I guess they missed that part of the Bible. I wonder what their understanding of Jesus Christ would sound like to us. I'm just curious, I don't really think I want to know. But according to those who think like this, Romans 8.28 means that, that that shooting happened for a reason and that that reason is skewed in the judgment of sin. And, and who are we to classify sin by varying degrees or as if another person's sin is any worse than our own? For those who take that kind of view, I, I just want to say, why don't you take the plank out of your own eye? Lord, save us from ourselves. You know, a pastor had just conducted a funeral service for one of her parishioners, and, and afterwards there was the typical funeral dinner, and she was sitting at a table with some of the family members, and the one sitting next to her said, you know, I've got to be honest with you. I'm not a big fan of ministers. Well, the pastor didn't really know what to say, and she didn't, hadn't known this particular family member had just met him a few days before, before the funeral. And so she smiled and very diplomatically said, well, I get that. I'm not always a big fan of ministers either. A lot of folks have trouble with ministers and for very good reasons. But then she went on to say, do you mind telling me just what the issue is that you have with ministers? Well, the pastor wasn't really prepared for what she said. And under normal circumstances, this woman might not have been so forthcoming, but, but grief can, can instill a liberating honesty. And so she said, you know, when I was in my 20s, my mother died of cancer. It was devastating because I was very, very close to my mother. And, and at the time, I had a friend who was a very strong Christian. And they told me that everything happens for a reason. She said, I just needed to accept that, that this was God's will, and move on. Well, you know, when she said that, I decided that I didn't want to have anything to do with a God like that, religion or ministers or the church. And the pastor did her best to try and explain how, her, how wrong and insensitive her friend's remarks had been, but, but the damage had really already been done. Well, did her friend have good intentions? Yes, I imagine so, most likely. And was she trying to be comforting? Well, in her own way, yeah, I think she was. She was. 
But the religious platitude presented God as someone who planned that tragedy in her life, and, and she wanted nothing to do with a God like that. And can you blame her? Maybe you know someone who, who's angry with God, who has those feelings towards God as if God caused the pain in their lives. Maybe they've just been dealt an extra hard hand at life. I believe that a whole lot of the time, God gets blamed for things that he didn't cause. You know, a baby dies and someone says, well, God needed another angel in heaven. A young mother dies, leaving a husband and two kids behind, and someone said, well, God works in mysterious ways. A 50-year-old overworks his whole life and doesn't take care of himself and dies of a heart attack, and someone says, well, the Lord knows best. A group of teenagers on their way to prom are killed in a car accident, and someone says, well, God must have a purpose in this. What? In other words, everything happens for a reason. What do you think? True or not? We often feel the need to try to explain why things happen. Things that defy our ability to understand it, and all we're left with are the whys. Sometimes things happen because of the foolishness of others. Sometimes things happen because of our own poor choices. Sometimes things happen because we live in an evil and imperfect world where there is joy and laughter and there is pain and tears. The God I know and love would not plot out suffering and tragedy. When God created us, he gave us free will and he loves us enough to allow us to choose to love him back. If God took our, away our freedom to do bad, he would also be taking away our freedom to do good. The shadow side of a world with free will is that there are, is room for, for bad choices and mistakes and bad timing and decisions, and all of which can cause pain and difficulty and frustration and tragedy and adversity. And just because bad things do happen, it doesn't mean God caused them to happen. So much of the pain we experience in life is, is based on the free will of others and the free will of the world. Then, then how do you choose to reckon with it? So then if Romans 8.28 does not mean that everything happens for a reason, then what does it mean? And how do we make sense of that verse? You know, like a lot of popular verses found in the Bible, this one is often misunderstood because it's taken out of its context. This passage appears in the book of Romans, and in Romans, Paul is addressing a group of Christians who are familiar with adversity. They have been persecuted for their faith in every imaginable way. And they've also dealt with the disappointments of life that all of us share. Paul helps them make sense of their suffering by articulating where God is in all of it. Paul is, is seeking to encourage the Roman Christians in their suffering by reminding them that there will come a day when there will be no more suffering. When Christ comes again, everything in the world will be renewed and healed. Paul tells us that creation groans groans with labor pains for, for this day of ultimate renewal and healing. Paul acknowledges suffering not as God's will, but as a fact of life. But he said, we wait with hope that one day, by the grace and power of God, all suffering in the world will cease. Paul finds the words of hope to encourage this new band of, of Christ followers. Listen to Paul's words. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul is reminding us that, 
that when we're weak and suffering and life is turned upside down, we don't even know how or what to pray. We're not God. Life is crazy sometimes, and we don't always know how to pray. Sometimes a sigh or a sob is all we can get out. I understand that. I get that. I know what it is to have my prayers feel like nothing more than sighs. How about you? But the great thing that Paul reminds us of is that God knows what we need. The Holy Spirit within us senses our yearnings at the very deepest level and lifts us up our prayers to God. And it's then that Paul gives us In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. What Paul is saying is that I know you're suffering, and nothing makes sense, and even your prayers don't make sense. But know this, God knows what you need. Just keep turning to God, even in the mess. And not only that, but God is working. He's going to work good out of this. He can take something that is, that is ugly and tragic and, and bring from it something beautiful and meaningful and precious. How do I know that? How do we know this is what Paul means? Let me explain why I say that. Just take a a look a few verses past this. I think it's beginning in verse 37 where he writes, In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God makes you a conqueror over the things that are against you. If suffering is the will of God, why would God give you the strength to conquer it? That, That would make sense. But by God's power, we are more than conquerors through suffering in life. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Paul tells us that too. He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. For Paul, being more than a conqueror means we are always equipped because the Holy Spirit dwells within us, because of the love of God, which nothing can ever separate us from. So then no matter how dark it might seem like life gets, no matter how painful or disappointing life becomes, God's love will always be there to sustain you and to empower you. You can handle anything in life because God is always with you. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, whatever pain you're in, God has not forsaken you. God is always available. When you call upon the Lord, you can have that sense, that that knowing of his presence that's there with you in those darkest moments. But even when it hurts and there's deep sorrow, he's there to help you bear it. I truly believe that God hurts when we hurt. God will not abandon you when you need him the most But sometimes it does feel that way, doesn't it? I mean, even Jesus said from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, God didn't abandon Jesus on the cross. He couldn't look upon the sin that his son bore on our behalf. But God loves you too much for you to deal with all of those things alone. You see, Jesus' death tells us that when we suffer, God suffers with us. That's what the cross and the resurrection is all about. God suffers when we suffer, and he has the power to redeem our suffering. Not only is God with us in the midst of our pain, he not only helps us get through it, but to be more than conquerors. How is that possible? How can we be more than a conqueror of pain and difficulty and adversity? 
we know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That means that suffering and tragedy is never God's will, but God can take what is ugly in our lives and make it beautiful. That's what makes us more than conquerors. It's like the song we sang just a little while ago. Something beautiful, something good, all my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Here's what I hope that you could take away from today's message. Everything that happens to you is not God's will. But God has a will in everything that happens to you. Everything that happens to you is not God's will. But God has a will in everything that happens to you. God has a will and he can always find a way to turn your trouble into triumph. That's the story of the Bible. God is in the business of transformation, not only in transforming us from the inside out, but also by transforming those things in our lives that may be taking us down another path, away from his will, by bringing us back in line with his will for our lives. It might be a different path than what we set out on. You know, when evil attacks with difficulty, God can transform it in a way that brings him glory. When evil attacks with pain, God uses that to build our character. When evil gives resistance, God uses that to build strength. When evil attacks with death, God brings new life. What life throws at you is not God's will, but God can take your difficulty and find a way to use it for good. You can walk in that confidence in the Lord. You can say, you know, I don't know what this day is going to bring, but I know that God will bring me through it. I know that there's nothing that I'm going to face that God can't handle. I know by the power of God I will be more than a conqueror. God can take what's ugly in our lives right here, right now, and make it beautiful. I don't know how, and I don't know when, but I know that he can. We see that time and time again when we have these devastating tragedies. It gives cause for the very best of humanity to come forth. You know, following these tragedies, we see communities rise to help those in need. It's an opportunity for the light of Christ to be seen and known where darkness and hopelessness and despair tries to inhabit. The potential for good to happen in all things is always there. And if we will but look, we begin to see God at work in those situations and circumstances. Now, everything that happens to you is not necessarily God's will, but God can take whatever happens and find a way for good to come from it. Everything that happens to you may not be God's will, but God has a will in everything that happens to you. Thanks be to God. Amen.